to compressed air systems four, supply side components. This is the fourth in a series of compressed air system courses offered by Energy University. If you have not already done so, it is recommended that you participate in the first three compressed air courses before taking this course. At the completion of this course, you will be able to identify the components of a compressed air system on the supply side and understand what they do. Explain why compressed air has to be cooled and dried and how this is achieved. Compare the operation, benefits, and drawbacks of different types of dryers. Identify the purpose of receivers and how they contribute to energy efficiency. Explain the purpose of filters and pressure control valves and describe how a pressure flow controller can provide stable, low pressure to the process to minimize unregulated air loss. Compressed air system components can usually be identified by the major function that they provide, whether the function is related to compression, conditioning, filtration, distribution, and some nature of end use. Most systems have a supply side and a demand side. The supply side is normally where ambient air is processed into a pressurized, dry, clean form that can be used for many useful tasks. The demand side is the portion of the plant where air is distributed, final filtered, regulated, and perhaps lubricated for a productive end use. The images in this slide depict both the supply side and the demand side of a typical industrial compressed air system. In previous classes, we learned some basic compressed air concepts and focused on the types of compressor and how they are controlled. However, there is much more to a compressed air system than just the compressor. In this course, we will learn about other components on the supply side of the system. The following components may be found as part of the supply side of a compressed air system. Air inlet filter, which filters particulate and water of incoming ambient air. The compressor, discussed in Compressed Air Systems 2, Compressor Types and Selection. They compress atmospheric air into a useful and versatile utility. During the process, lubricants could be present. After cooler, cools compress or discharge air and condenses up to 70% of the moisture drawn into the compressor. Separator, separates condensed liquids leaving the after cooler. Automatic drain, automatically drains condensate out of the separator and other conditioning devices. Primary receiver, provides storage for compressed air supply in case a compressor fails. This can give time for an additional compressor to start up with little pressure loss and no interruption in production. Pre-filter improves performance, reliability, and service life of the dryer. Dryer condenses and removes moisture that was not removed by the after cooler. Cold Coalescer condenses and removes oil vapors at the most efficient location. Adsorber removes the leftover traces of oil and water vapors. After Filter removes leftover particles. Dry Receiver and Pressure Flow Controller, if used, can provide final pressure regulation for the system. Let's now discuss water in compressed air systems. To deliver air of the required quality, we need to manage its temperature and moisture content. Equipment such as intercoolers, aftercoolers, and dryers perform valuable moisture removal functions. Pressure dew point and frost point are important quantities when managing compressed air. These are the temperatures at which condensation or frost will first occur in piping. Condensation is the formation of liquid. Frost is the formation of ice crystals in piping. 
Typically, compressed air must be dried because the equipment that relies on compressed air needs to be moisture free. Moisture free can have many definitions, but generally the actual requirement is to have no droplets or frost in the compressed air piping. The actual dew point requirement normally depends on the minimum temperature that the compressed air piping will be exposed to, but there can be process requirements for dry air too. The level of dryness required has a direct impact on the cost of purchasing drying equipment and the cost of drying the air. Throttling the air pressure through a reducing valve will result in a new, lower pressure dew point of that airstream. In a multi-stage compressor, there will typically be an intercooler between each stage. This is a heat exchanger that removes the heat of compression before the air enters the next stage. As the air is cooled, the airstream may fall to its pressure dew point and any additional cooling causes water vapor to condense out. Condensate is separated from the compressed air and drained out of the system. An aftercooler cools air leaving the compressor. Sometimes it is an integral part of the compressor package, but sometimes it is a separate heat exchanger. Intercoolers and aftercoolers can use ambient air or water for cooling. Cooling water circulates through a series of coils. Hot, moist, compressed air passes through the heat exchanger. Heat is exchanged from the air to the chilled water. As this compressed air is cooled, the pressure dew point is reached and water vapor condenses in the heat exchanger and is drained away through a condensate trap. The cooling water passing through the coils is now warmed after capturing heat from the hot compressed air. The cooling water exits the exchanger and carries heat for rejection to a cooling tower or to a chiller. Potentially, this waste heat may be recovered. Since more than 80% of the electrical energy used by the compressor is changed into heat, this can be a valuable resource for energy and cost savings. If chilled water is used for cooling, energy savings potential is significant. See our class on waste heat recovery for more on this topic. A moisture separator installed following each intercooler or aftercooler is used to remove condensate created by cooling air below its pressure dew point. Separators may contain baffles that force the air to change direction. The water drops have greater mass and inertia and tend to collect on the baffles. Impingement separators are similar. They are shaped so as to collect the moisture on their surfaces. Baffle and impingement types are 80 to 90% efficient. Another type is shaped to force the air into a cyclone and throw off the free water. Cyclone types are 90 to 95% efficient. Finally, some more complex types incorporate a centrifugal action and are the most efficient with a performance over 95% and sometimes even over 99%. Over 20 liters of water may be removed each day from a compressor making 170 SCMH of compressed air at approximately 7 bar when the pressure dew point is reduced from 38 degrees Celsius to 2 degrees Celsius. This would be equivalent to over 6 gallons of water from a compressor making 100 SCFM of compressed air at approximately 100 PSIA. When the pressure dew point is reduced from 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Without aftercoolers, separators, and dryers, much of this water would end up down the piping system causing corrosion and damage to system components. Liquids collected at intercoolers and aftercoolers need to be drained out of the system. Traps are used to trap expensive compressed air while allowing condensate and perhaps oil to be safely and efficiently drained away. Liquid condensate traps and a proper piping arrangement are shown in these images. 
always check for proper size, conduct leak checks, and repair leaks. Check for blockage. Manual valves are sometimes used, but their use is discouraged. The disadvantage is that they must be opened and closed by an operator. The valve may be left open to allow condensate to drain, allowing compressed air to continually escape into the atmosphere. Float type traps do not waste air, but they often have demanding requirements for maintenance and are prone to blocking by sediment. An electrically operated solenoid valve can be used with an adjustable timer, but setting the timer correctly can be an issue. The valve may open more often than needed and waste air, or not enough, and fail to provide adequate drainage. Zero air loss traps with reservoirs incorporate float or level sensors and electric or pneumatic signals to open valves. The reservoir must be drained periodically to avoid fouling. Oil water separators may be required by local wastewater authorities on drains if the air compressor is a design that uses lubrication. The liquid condensate from the aftercoolers will also contain oil. Most countries have laws that forbid dumping this oily water on the ground into waterways or into sewers. Failing to comply with these requirements can be very costly. Receivers are vessels used to store compressed air until it is required. There will typically be a primary receiver on the supply side and another on the demand side. Air compressors work efficiently when they are operated at full rated load. When operated under partial load, they will use more energy per unit of airflow. This means that if there are intermittent peaks in the demand for compressed air, the compressor will work efficiently during these brief peak periods and inefficiently all the rest of the time. A receiver provides a reservoir of compressed air. The receiver acts as storage and can serve out compressed air over a prescribed range of pressures to meet intermittent peak loads. If short-term peak air demand can be served from air stored in the receiver, it's not necessary for a large compressor to be turned on. This saves energy and perhaps eliminates the need for extra compressor investment. Or a smaller compressor can be used. It may work more hours of the day in order to store up the required air, but it will operate at higher efficiency than a large compressor that is only part loaded, operating for short periods of time. This is the formula for calculating the volume of a receiver. It can be rearranged like this. Here's the formula showing metric units and with U.S. customary units. In the past, when energy was of little concern, system receiver capacity was sized for about 2.2 liters per standard cubic meter per hour, or approximately one gallon per standard cubic feet per minute, based on compressor capacity. Applying that rule, the recommended volumes would be shown in these tables. It is important to note that receiver capacity is inexpensive and improves system performance. For efficient operation, rotary screw compressors operating under load-unload control should be sized with between 11 and 22 liters of receiver capacity per SCMH or between 5 and 10 gallons per SCFM. This guideline would result in the following sizing recommendations. Remember, piping volume counts as receiver capacitance too, and large pipe results in good pressure flow distribution through the system for energy savings. Let's discuss dryers now. 
After passing through the aftercooler and separator, the air is still saturated. If this air is delivered to the plant as is, moisture will condense as it cools further and potentially corrode equipment or interfere with processes. Therefore, we need to dry the air before it is passed onto the plant. Dryers are used for this. Deliquescent absorption dryers are rare but can be found in certain locations. They use a medium to absorb the moisture. Over time, the medium changes from a solid to a liquid which is drained away and eventually has to be replaced. The medium may be sodium, potassium, or calcium salts or based on urea. The liquid must be properly disposed of according to environmental regulations. These dryers suppress the dew point temperature an amount below what it was when it entered the dryer. Performance values yield air dried to an extent equivalent to 11 to 14 degrees Celsius or 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit change in dew point. Refrigerant dryers are more common than deliquescent dryers. Like the compressor aftercooler, it works by cooling the air with refrigeration so that the vapor condenses. We may not want to send cool air to the plant, so most dryers have a heat recovery exchanger to improve dryer performance, reduce electrical consumption, and to warm the dried air before sending it out to the plant. Most refrigerant dryers can be classified into cycling and non-cycling types. Cycling dryers cool compressed air indirectly through an intermediate substance. The air is exposed to a thermal storage medium like refrigerant or chilled water in coils or even masses of aluminum granules or bronze ribbon. The medium is chilled and then the compressed air gives up heat to the medium. The dryer is controlled by one or two thermostats that turn off the refrigeration when it is not needed. This allows the dryer to cycle depending on the demand of the system. Here we can see an example of a non-cycling dryer. It cools the air directly using direct expansion processes. There is no cold medium removing the heat from the air. Instead, the warm, moist, compressed air passes through two heat exchangers. One exchanger to pre-cool incoming hot, moist, compressed air while reheating cold refrigerant, dried, compressed air ready to be supplied to the plant. The second heat exchanger is a refrigerant to air exchanger using a vapor compression refrigeration cycle for cooling used to further reduce the compressed air temperature down just above freezing so more moisture can be condensed out of the airstream. Again, this cold air is reheated in the first heat exchange as it passes through pre-cooling the moist warm incoming airstream. These dryers can dry the air to an extent equivalent to 20 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees Fahrenheit pressure dew point temperature. Another type of dryer relies on desiccant materials to absorb moisture, like the packets of silica gel that you find in some consumer goods. The air entering the dryer must be free from oil. The air passes through a tower of desiccant granules and the substance captures the moisture in its pores. Desiccant material can hold only so much moisture and periodically it must be taken offline and regenerated so it can again be used for the drying process. Generally, there are two towers so that one can be in service while the other one regenerates. The dryer may have a built-in regeneration cycle to change from the spent active tower to the newly regenerated tower. The regeneration cycle can be done in a number of ways. We will look at the least efficient method first and progress to the most efficient method.
the pressure swing heatless method is achieved by reducing the pressure in the container and passing previously dried compressed purge air through the material. This uses a lot of valuable compressed air during tower cycling and by using dried compressed air for purge air. Heated exhaust purge includes a heated tower bed or heated dried compressed purge airflow for drying. This also wastes some compressed air during purge and tower cycling, but less of it than the heatless method. The heated blower purge method uses ambient air that may be produced by a blower. It may be heated within the dryer or externally to reduce the amount of purge air required. This is more efficient than compressed air purge air methods of regeneration, but some compressed air waste occurs when the tower depressurizes to start the regeneration process. Heat of compression dryers may be used in certain applications. Very hot air leaves the compressor without any aftercooling and is passed through a regenerating tower to drive off moisture from the desiccant using the heat in the air. The air enters an intercooler, which is used to cool the very warm and now moist airstream and condense much of the moisture it contains. When the air exits the intercooler, it then passes through the active desiccant tower to be final dried to a very low pressure dew point. Another version uses a heat wheel type of arrangement, diverting discharge air into two separate airstreams through the desiccant. Here we see airstream A, which is cold, saturated air coming from the aftercooler. This passes through the desiccant and exits as dry air. Over time, the desiccant needs to be regenerated. The drum of the desiccant rotates so that gradually the used desiccant passes into airstream B. Airstream B is hot, unsaturated air coming from the compressor outlet before the aftercooler. This may be further heated to produce even hotter air. The hot purge air passes through the desiccant and regenerates it. As the air passes through, it picks up moisture from the desiccant and exits as hot saturated air. The purge air stream is then cooled and passes back through the wheel to be dried. Desiccant dryers can achieve dew points well below the freezing point of water. Because of these extremely low dew points, the entire air stream does not have to be dried. This can greatly reduce operating costs. Desiccant is not very effective if the inlet conditions are above 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, except for heat of compression dryers, which need hot compressor discharge air to function. The cost of operating each type of dryer can vary considerably. Deliquescent dryers are the least costly to run, but they do not dry as well, achieving relatively high pressure dew points of about 15 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Normally, lower pressure dew points are needed and other, more costly dryers are required. Refrigerant dryers are economical to operate and are suitable for most applications. Desiccant dryers provide very dry air for cold or critical applications. Pressure swing desiccant are least expensive but cost the most in energy. Heated purge and blower purge improve on the economics of operation at a higher initial cost. Heat of compression desiccant dryers provide operating costs that are relatively low and also can serve up very low dew point. The disadvantage is that the capital costs of this type may be significantly higher and this type of dryer is not suitable for all compressor applications. Be sure to evaluate the total cost of ownership when choosing dryer equipment. A tool to help with this can be downloaded from the attachments of this class. 
it provides typical values of the electrical load of different types of dryer. You can adjust the pink cells to reflect the size of your system, the total operating hours per year, the currency that you use, and the unit cost of energy. There are two tabs, one for SI countries, which expresses the air volume in cubic meters per hour, and one for the US, with the air volume in cubic feet per minute. The tool will give you an approximate indication of the relative cost of the different methods. More accurate comparisons should be done by an expert and may need to take into account impact on peak demand charges as well as energy charges. A compressed air system includes a variety of filters. Filters appear at the air inlet to remove particles and moisture before they enter the compressor. They are also located within the compressed air system to protect equipment downstream of the compressor. Cleaning and replacing filters is an important part of the system maintenance to preserve its efficiency. Particulate filters remove debris. Many compressed air systems also include filters to remove odors. Airline filters may be located on the demand side to provide additional protection if required by some equipment. Coalescing filters have a very fine mesh that removes lubricant oil from the compressed air. The element of a coalescing filter is often made of glass fibers. The oil vapor coalesces onto these fibers and drips down into a filter bowl. An adsorption filter may also be used to remove any last traces of oil. Adsorption is a process whereby oil molecules adhere to a surface of adsorbent material. It's a surface phenomenon, so it differs from absorption in which the material becomes permeated. The material is typically a type of activated carbon. Adsorption filters are also known as vapor filters. Air quality requirements of the process dictate the level of solids, dew point, and oil content for various ISO quality classifications. Up-to-date copies of this standard are available from ISO. Pressure flow controllers are devices that separate the supply side from the demand side influences. These are comprised of custom engineered components, including a dry receiver and a pressure flow control valve and a control system. The flow controller manages the flow of air from the dry receiver on the supply side into the distribution system. With a flow controller, you can precisely control the demand side pressure to a set point less than a normal system would be set to. This reduces air lost through unregulated leaks and loads. The dry receiver contains air, usually between half and one atmosphere, higher than the downstream pressure. That's approximately 5 PSI to 10 PSI higher. This volume of air is available for release during short periods to serve intermittent plant loads without starting another compressor. Any pressure variations that occur on the supply side are confined away from the demand side. Without a pressure flow controller, pressure swings transmitted to unregulated end-use devices can result in added air loss waste. Stable pressure control can be seen in the graph depicted in the slide. The upper line represents output from the plant air compressors. The lower line is the precise pressure output from the pressure flow controller. The main function of a PFC is to separate the demand side of the system from the supply side and to allow pressure to the distribution system to be maintained at a steady level sufficient to meet end-use requirements. 
primary dry receiver volume upstream of the controller is essential to ensure the required flow to the system. The main advantage seen here is that the supply to the distribution system can be maintained at around 6 bar or 90 PSIG or less with small variations of plus or minus 0.05 bar or plus or minus 1 PSI. This provides a constant system pressure and minimizes artificial demand from unregulated uses and leaks. Some systems can operate safely down to 4 bar or 60 PSIG. If installed, it is very important that plant maintenance staff understand the operation of this system and keep it maintained properly in service. A normal failure mode of the controller is to move to a full open position, resulting in no savings at all to the owner. Let's summarize some of the information that we have discussed in this course. We identified the components of a compressed air system, including filters, the compressor itself, intercoolers and aftercoolers, separators and drains, receivers, dryers, and cleaning devices such as the cold coalescer, adsorber, and afterfilter. We learned that dry air is important to prevent damage to equipment and interference with processes. We learned about deliquescent absorption dryers, which are low cost, but do not dry as well as some other types. Refrigerant dryers, which are economical and suitable for most applications. Desiccant dryers, which are expensive, but provide very dry air. And heat of absorption dryers, which are economical and can also provide very dry air, but at higher capital costs. We saw that receivers provide air storage, that prevents running a large compressor for short peak periods. Using a smaller compressor to store up air is more energy efficient. We saw that a pressure flow controller separates the supply and demand sides of the system to provide stable, low pressure to the process. This minimizes unregulated air loss.